Welcome back to The Wasteland, everybody. Today we're going to be talking about the Fallout TV show, which just recently released on Amazon Prime. So if you got Amazon Prime, you can watch it right now. It's all eight episodes that are out currently for season one, and it definitely appears that there is going to be a season two, so I'm looking forward to that. So whenever making a video game adaptation into a movie or a TV series, I'm always a little bit hesitant about that just because I've seen how poorly it can go in the past. I am going to be using still shots from the actual show, and if you were worried about this show potentially not feeling like Fallout or potentially just flopping, I would say that it did actually quite a good job on both those parts where it does feel like Fallout. It definitely nails the vibe of Fallout very, very well, which is really cool to see. And it works quite well as a standalone series as well if you've never played any of the Fallout games. You might end up liking this one, especially if you like post-apocalyptic, retro-futuristic, dark comedy, and maybe even some horror thrown in. This series actually hits all of those quite well. So let's talk about each of these episodes. I am going to be spoiling a large portion of this series. However, if you're familiar with Fallout lore, this probably won't be all that shocking to have a lot of the reveals in here. So... Keep that in mind. If you would like to see the entire series without being spoiled, then please go off and do that before watching the rest of this video, because I actually do genuinely believe the series is quite good and definitely worthwhile. This is one of the few video game shows, or at least shows based on a video game, that I would actually recommend. So the very first episode to the Fallout TV series is called The End. Now, this one gives us a lot of backstory about the main characters that we're going to be following throughout the rest of the story. This is pretty common in a lot of TV shows where the first episode kind of goes over the world building and also just the setting that we're going to be in. So we're following three characters in particular, Lucy, Maximus, and Cooper, or the Ghoul, whichever you would like to call him since both are fairly accurate. Lucy is a Vault Dweller, which if you're unfamiliar with the Fallout series, then Vault Dwellers live underground, they live in giant vaults, these vaults were made by vault Tech, and all you really need to know about vault Tech is that they are extremely evil, usually, and very um, bizarre in the way that they function. So they created the vaults so that everybody could have a place to stay after the bombs dropped from the inevitable war that was coming up. It is also heavily implied by the end of this series that vault Tech was responsible for dropping the bombs in the first place. This isn't actually confirmed in the show at any point, this is just something that is suggested. And technically, lore-wise, I think the aliens are supposed to have something to do with the bombs being dropped, and that's why Fallout is the way that it is. But I actually don't really like that as much as just vault Tech doing it so that they could uh, secure the vaults and then create their own utopia. It also sets up the Fallout setting and the setting of the vault very, very well, where the vault dwellers are generally considered fairly good but very naive people, at least in this vault. That's not always the case to all the other vaults. We are in Vault 33. This is also connected to Vault 32 and Vault 31. And if you know anything about the vaults, there's always an experiment going on within the vaults. And this is the only case that we've seen in any of the Fallout series where we actually have had three vaults connected to one another. That really hasn't been a thing. We've seen vaults connected to other buildings or other things throughout the series. You can find that in like Fallout 4, Fallout 2. So it's not too unusual for this to be connected, but it is unusual for it to be connected to another vault. On top of that, Lucy is going to be married off to somebody in Vault 32. At the end of this, since this is going to be part of a trade to Vault 32, which is pretty interesting. We'll come back to that, though, since it brings up some other characters that we need to talk about, too. We move over to Maximus, who is the new Brotherhood initiate, or one of the new initiates in the Brotherhood. And the Brotherhood in this one is definitely portrayed more like the Brotherhood in Fallout 4, which is kind of closer to the Enclave than the Brotherhood in really any of the other Fallouts. Now, this does depend on the different chapters of the Brotherhood that you're in. The Brotherhood of Steel is one of the most powerful factions in the entire Wasteland in the Fallout lore, and they've appeared in every single Fallout game up to this point, where they were in Fallout 1, 2, 3, 4, New Vegas, Tactics. They were in all of them, and generally being either a major or a minor player, depending on which area they were in. This is going to be the West Coast chapter of the Brotherhood, which doesn't really function like the West Coast chapter that we've seen in Fallout 1 and 2, I guess it sort of does. This is more like the East Coast faction in Fallout 4. So they are a bit more uh, militaristic and a bit more uh, land claimy than basically they are in some of the other Fallout games. And then we also have Cooper, who is a ghoul who used to be a movie star. Funny enough, this is played by Walton Goggins. He was the main actor that I did know going into this. I'm glad that they got him into this series because I think he actually does a really good job of this. Kind of functioning as like the spokesman of the Vault Tech commercials functioning as a famous cowboy in a lot of his movies that are, at least towards the end of this, turning more into like uh, anti-communism propaganda, which is very fitting for the Fallout universe. And he is now a ghoul outlaw or a ghoul bounty hunter in the Wasteland. So if you're unfamiliar with what ghouls are in the Wasteland, they are people that have survived the Wasteland so long but have been 
so heavily affected by the radiation that their body is kind of falling apart. They usually come across as somewhat zombie-like. I did hear some mentions of Walton Goggins' character looking more like a smooth skin, especially since he's supposed to be over 200 years old. Smooth skin is kind of like the, uh, the way that ghouls talk about humans, where you have smoother skin, it's not falling apart like a lot of the ghouls are. I honestly don't find this to be that big of a problem because he still looks like a ghoul. There was some weird scenes that I noticed a little bit when he turns where I think they just put like a green screen thing on his nose so that they could cut it out in post. You can kind of see that if you look close enough, but uh, don't let that distract you from it. I think he does a fantastic job as the ghoul. He does a fantastic job as Cooper before this, where at least in the past, you can see him being a lot more optimistic than as he is later as the ghoul, where he is, uh, not a nice person, which I do appreciate them actually doing that in the Fallout series because a lot of the wasteland is not necessarily like the nicest place to be. We also get to see some cool stuff from Cooper as well. Like we get to see the junk jet being used, which is awesome. That's such a cool weapon to see in Fallout where the junk jet and the rocket launcher from Fallout 3 and Fallout 4 were just weapons that could fire any sort of garbage out of them and you could use it as a weapon. Seems really fitting. We get some other weapons that we see throughout this as well that fit really well in the Fallout world. Some of them that we've seen before, like we get multiple 10 millimeter pistols all throughout the series, whether that be the old like Fallout 1, Fallout 2 looking 10 millimeter pistol, all the way up to the Fallout 4 really big blocky looking pistol. I didn't notice any 10 millimeter pistols that looked like they were from Fallout 3 in New Vegas though. As well as we get some other cool ones like uh, Cooper's lever action shotgun that he's got on his back. We've seen that in New Vegas before. We, he's got his own revolver which as far as I can tell is probably the Russian shotgun revolver th thing that has been cut down into a pistol. I'm assuming they did this because they wanted each character have their own unique weapons where Maximus has his power armor because he is part of the Brotherhood. You've got Lucy with a syringer type weapon. It's not the syringer from Fallout 4, but at least it looks somewhat similar to that. And it's not the dart gun from Fallout 3 either. It's somewhere kind of in between. And then we've also got Cooper with his guns that fit the Western vibe of it really well, which will be pretty cool, at least if we go where I'm pretty sure we're going in season two. But then we also get to see some other stuff that's going on throughout the wasteland, like the Enclave. And this is where we get our first look at kind of a super mutant. At least we get to see an arm of a super mutant. We don't actually get to see a super mutant in the series, which is kind of a bummer to me. I was really hoping to see what the super mutants actually look like. I'm imagining most of it would have to be CG. But even so, the CG that was used in the series is quite good in my opinion. And then we also get to finish this episode off with the Raiders showing up. And it's pretty obvious when the Raiders are coming in, if you know anything about the Raiders. So episode one ends with Lucy's father getting kidnapped by the Raiders. The Raiders killing a good portion of the vault, the vault dwellers killing a good portion of the Raiders, capturing some of them, and then the vault trying to rebuild. So I think starting out with episode one like this is quite good. It gives you a whole lot of world building, and that's, I think, the most important part of Fallout. There's also some really cool things that they did with this season and with throughout the show where you get to see like sound effects being used from all throughout the game. A lot of music from the games that are being used, which are classic songs, which are really cool. I can't play any of them because whenever I have tried to play them, even on stream, when I've been streaming the Fallout games, they get claimed. So sorry about that. Episode two starts and this one is called The Target. This one is where everybody is trying to find the scientist from the Enclave that ran off because he's got some sort of technology that everybody needs. At least it seems like he's working with the Enclave. I don't think that this is actually ever confirmed because the Brotherhood assumes that it's from the Enclave and we're kind of only getting their take from it. He was definitely part of some sort of facility, so it was probably the Enclave. If not the Enclave, then the Institute, but we never seen any synths. Synths might be showing up in the show later, so it might be the Institute, but it's more than likely the Enclave, which uh, the Enclave are also not really nice people either. But there is a whole lot of offshoots to them, similar to like the Brotherhood chapters. We also get one of the first interactions with Maximus with the Brotherhood, where he is now the squire to one of the knights, the Knight Titus. And Titus is uh, definitely a Fallout 4 Brotherhood character. And for some reason, a lot of the Brotherhood members in like 4 and in this show are just jerks for no apparent reason, which seems a little bit weird, especially considering the Brotherhood in the previous games where they generally aren't. They're usually more highly looked upon, especially like the higher ups, like the Knights and the Paladins. We also get to see a Yao Guai in this episode, which is really cool to see. I think it's actually rendered pretty well. It is CG, but it's not too distracting or anything. We get a pretty funny moment with Titus freaking out and running away from the Yao Guai. And this is also how Maximus gets his power armor, which his power armor does actually look really cool, especially after the Yao Guai has chewed on it, sliced it apart. It looks worn like a lot of the coolest looking power armors in the wasteland. 
I really wouldn't be surprised if with the new update that we're getting to Fallout 4 in like two weeks from now, if we get a lot of this stuff in the Creation Club, which I kind of hope not because a lot of it's already been modded in by modders and I would just go for that. But if it's free stuff, that's awesome. If not, then yeah, that's something else. We also get to see a lot more uh, over the top violence in this episode too, where you see like Walton Goggins character shoot the foot off of the scientist cleanly, him blowing apart people and just taking their heads off. You get to see Maximus crushing a dude's head with the power armor. So like, there, there is a lot of just over-the-top violence in this, which I can appreciate. I, I'm glad that they put that into Fallout because sometimes Fallout can be extremely gory, even more so if you have, like, bloody mess going. And that's something else I would have liked to see in the show because I didn't see anybody taking perks, and I really would have liked to see some perks implemented or, like, a level-up system when the characters do something, especially Lucy since she's got the Pip-Boy and she's got the overhead of it. The Pip-Boys are also really well done. I think that's really cool to see in the show where it actually does have a lot of the sound effects of it and they seem to function similar to the Pip-Boys do in the rest of the games. Also, nobody used VATS. Nobody uses VATS in this. I mean, you could, I guess, argue that the ghoul uses VATS, sort of, or that he's just a really good gunslinger. We also get to see Lucy cut a guy's head off at the very end of this, so that's pretty interesting. And we get to see the Ripper, which is really cool. I'm, I'm really glad that they had the Ripper being shown on there. It looks more like a Ripper from, like, Fallout 4, although it folds. Kind of reminds me of, like, a Bloodborne weapon, but, yeah, very fitting. Very cool to see. Moving to Episode 3, the head of the scientist that Lucy's carrying around kind of gets lost. This one serves more of a function to go through the vault, kind of seeing the process of the vault, and how the Vault Dwellers are sort of getting along with this now that Vault 33 has been destroyed. But we also get to see Thaddeus showing up, who is a Brotherhood initiate, now made into a Brotherhood Squire, that is now going to be accompanying Maximus, who is now pretending to be the previous knight that died. So, Knight Titus. Thaddeus is actually pretty fun whenever he does show up. He's kind of a jerk to start out with, like a lot of the Brotherhood is, but gradually gets better over time. There are some other issues that kind of come up with him later on, but... We'll talk about that when we get to it. We also kind of get a start to see how bad the wasteland can kind of be. We do get to see a couple different mutated animals throughout this as well. I was hoping for some of them. Like I said, we don't really get a super mutant. We don't actually get a death claw throughout this series at any point. Although we do get a death claw skull at the very end of the last episode which I'm hoping that we do get full-size death claws because I would really like to see them. And then we get certain things like the giant rad roaches, which I guess are seen as more of a threat in the series, which is kind of weird because in like any of the games, the rad roaches are more seen as a joke where children can kill them. Dogmeat eats one of them. Dogmeat's in this too. I forgot about him, but Dogmeat's here. He's a scientist dog from the Enclave who was sort of spared. So it's cool that we get to see dog meat on here more. We also get to see people using actual like objects from the, the games as well, which is really awesome where we get to see, like, the stim packs being used to heal up people, where we also get to see, like, Rataway used on Lucy in a later episode, since she's suffering from radiation sickness. We've got, like, the Raiders in the very first episode using things like Jet, which I'm assuming Jet works like it does in Fallout 4, but Jet... Jet's function is different in every single Fallout game, or almost every single Fallout game. So, who knows what it actually does in this one. As well as we do get to start seeing Cooper using the drugs, too. So this one is kind of a new drug that's been added into the series and it's just for ghouls, which I'm not sure exactly what that's going to be. I guess it's just a new drug that's there. And it also is unclear if every ghoul needs this or only certain ghouls need this. We get to see a gulper in this episode too, so that's pretty cool. The gulper does look different than it does in Fallout 4, where they were definitely darker and more... I guess it's still salamander-like, but not quite the same salamander-like. You could always explain this away as just another variant of the mutation anyway, so I don't really think that that's an issue. We also get to see a deer in this, which I was kind of surprised they didn't pick like a rad stag or something to go along with it, since that's also in Fallout 4. And by the very end of this episode, Maximus and Thaddeus actually do have the severed head, so they're going to be taking that back to the Brotherhood, or at least that's the plan of it. Episode 4 comes around, and this one is called The Ghouls. Now, The Ghouls is definitely more of a horror episode, and just shows the horrors of the wasteland overall. Because this one, you're mostly following Cooper, who is well adapted to the wasteland now, and he's got Lucy as his prisoner. This includes Lucy drinking from radiated water sources. Cooper just straight up eating a guy. Yeah, he's got the cannibal perk, so th there's that. Or maybe it's the ghoulish appetite perk at this point, since it's another ghoul that he's eating. This shows a little bit more with the ghoul's drug as well where this ghoul's drug is supposed to keep you from going feral, which is interesting because that's never really been established in any of the other Fallout games. And again, this might just be because of the type of ghouls that these people are. This might not affect every ghoul. We do have ghouls that have lasted for basically forever. I mean, Harold's been in almost every Fallout game. He's been in Fallout 1, 2, Tactics, and 3. 
So he, he's been around for quite a while. We've got some other ghouls like Raul, who's been around for basically forever too. And it seems like Cooper has also been around for forever too. It's interesting that he needs to take this sort of drug. And it's never really explained what this drug is or how to make this drug or anything like that. Lucy is going to be sold off to get her organs, well, taken away from her by a, another robot. So we do get to see quite a few of the robots too. And we also get to see the voice actor of Codsworth here, which is pretty awesome. But we get to see the Codsworth-like robots, the Mr. Handy bots, and we get to see an Assault Tron that is buried in the sand. We don't ever get to see, like, a Protectron or a Robo... Well, we sort of see a Robo Brain, but not exactly a giant Robo Brain like some of them are. We also get to see the inside of a Super Duper Mart, which, if you've played any of the Fallout games, you know the inside of a Super Duper Mart is never really a safe place to be. In this case, it's full of ghouls, similar to how it is in Fallout 4. And these ghouls are the feral ghouls, at least some of them. Some of them are just the regular ghouls. Regular ghouls don't have the problems of being a feral ghoul. If you're a feral ghoul, you're basically a zombie and you try to attack people. If you're a regular ghoul, then you usually have a lot of your mental faculties there. Just you're not always the best to be around the wasteland, or at least it's not the safest to be a ghoul around the wasteland, because sometimes people do shoot you on sight or try to attack you or try to rob you, sadly. But uh, yeah, the feral ghouls will try to attack you on sight and try to eat you, usually. So we do get some backstory there, which is kind of cool, and it's a, it's a nice introduction to this. We also get to see Lucy changing up her clothing a little bit so she's not wearing the same vault tech suit. Now it's been modified to look very similar to, like, the armored vault suit that you can find in some of the other Fallout games, like in Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas. I like that little touch quite a bit, as well as she's got the 10mm pistol from Fallout 4 at this point. On to episode 5, this one is called The Past. Now, The Past is, I think, the one that people kind of take problems with, or at least it seems that way, because I had seen, like, Fallout New Vegas is getting retconned by Bethesda, and this episode is largely pointed to it because it has the fall of Shady Sands. If you know anything about Fallout lore, Shady Sands is where the New California Republic, which is basically the largest army in the wasteland, that is where they originally started. This is set up in Fallout 1, and it's a main city in Fallout 2. It's also a main faction in Fallout New Vegas. But at this point, Shady Sands has been completely nuked off of the map. Now, it is explained as to why this happens later on into the series, but I did see some mentions of people saying, like, how did somebody get a nuke to blow up something like this? Or who blew up the NCR? Or this is the, the canon ending of New Vegas. And it's like, um... We don't really know that yet, because there was multiple endings to New Vegas. You yourself in New Vegas could blow up part of the NCR. This wasn't Shady Sands, but this was a section of the NCR, so you could do that. You could also blow up the Legion, or you could blow up both of them. And this doesn't really mean that the NCR is completely destroyed. I mean, I had first seen this, and, well, parts of the Brotherhood has been destroyed throughout the past. The Enclave has been blown up, like, twice in Fallout 2 and Fallout 3, and there's still factions of them surviving. The Great Cons were beaten up pretty bad throughout previously in New Vegas and in Fallout 1 and Fallout 2. They still persist. So, I doubt that the NCR is gone in any, like, major way. The, the Capital City might be destroyed, but that doesn't really mean that the NCR is just completely gone. And that also doesn't mean that the events of Fallout New Vegas didn't happen, uh, especially towards the end of this. So I just wanted to bring that up because it seems like a weird point of contention right now. We also get to see more of vault Tech just being evil, or at least it's heavily implied that vault Tech is being evil in this episode. And that's kind of the main points of this one, as well as it ends in another vault. Which, you know, another vault means another experiment vault that we gotta be in. Episode 6 is called The Trap. This one, we actually get to see more of the past, so we get to see more of Cooper being an actor. And before the war, we also get to see the voice of Codsworth here. Just being a regular actor, as well as being the voice actor for the robots, which, I mean, two thumbs up there. Really love that. We also get to see some more old world lore leading up to the bombs that it fell on the Great War. So, this is basically an escalation between the United States and China, where... The, these are the two major factions that are going to be bombing each other. It, it never really brings up the fact that, like, Canada was annexed or anything, although that's also canon lore in the Fallout universe where the U.S. annexed Canada and the, the U.S. and China had a war in Alaska over Anchorage where the Americans won that, but then the bombs fell after this. We also kind of get that reference whenever we hear Cooper talking about the war that he fought in because he said he fought in a war up north which is heavily implied that he was at Anchorage. He was probably in the Battle of Anchorage, as well as it seems like a couple of his other friends that are now celebrities or in the business that he's in do know one another and are war veterans, which wouldn't be unusual in 
the world of Fallout. And we also get to find out that the vault that Lucy and Maximus are now currently in are definitely more cultists, definitely on the weirder side, which, I mean, isn't that unusual for Fallout. There's a lot of cults throughout Fallout, so it, it is kind of funny that they're there, especially with the reveal in the next episode, which this one is called Episode 7, The Radio, and this is kind of a big misunderstanding that happens throughout the vault. I think this episode nails the humor of it just being very goofy in Fallout. It does it really well here, where, like, in the past, when we had, like, episode four with the ghouls, where it was very dark, very bleak, very gruesome, that is a very good part to be showing of Fallout, because there is a lot of quests, there is a lot of backstories, and there's a lot of things that are just dark and gruesome, and there's not really a whole lot of humor about it. This episode is kind of the flip of that, where this is very kind of over-the-top, very silly, very fun, and that also fits in Fallout really well. It's just sometimes, especially in like Fallout 4, they don't always mesh very well together with the stories of what's being told. New Vegas does this really well. Fallout 3, I think, does this really well. Fallout 2 does it extremely well to where you can go from a very dark and serious story, especially in like, let's say Fallout 3, where you have like the pit where there's no real like jokes. There's nothing really fun about that. It's like everybody there is kind of bad. Everybody there is kind of evil and you're not really that different and uh, you get to make choices that aren't going to make you feel good one way or the other. As opposed to that in Fallout 3 at least, you can do a mission where you're just trying to collect all of unique soda bottles to give to this girl who's a massive Nuka-Cola fan. And it's really cool that we do see Nuka-Cola all throughout here. We don't see any Sunset Sarsaparilla though. I don't know why that is. They should put in some more Sunset Sarsaparilla. Acknowledge New Vegas a little bit more. Maybe that'll be for Season 2. We also get to see NCR Ranger gear in Episode 7 too, which is really cool to see. Although these guys aren't NCR Rangers, or probably aren't NCR Rangers that we do get to see it on, it's still really cool that we get to have that on there, though, because that is one of the coolest looking outfits in all of Fallout. And we also get another kind of weird thing where Thaddeus is now turned into a ghoul by a snake oil salesman. So I don't know how this works lore-wise either because the ghouls were usually exposed to radiation over a very long period of time. Now this could be some other genetic mutation similar to like the FEV virus with the super mutants. However, that's not really brought up in the show. So maybe he got a strain of this that can put his body back together, but it does seem to come with some side effects. That's kind of cool to see, but he is freaked out because the Brotherhood would kill him if he's a ghoul which sounds Brotherhood-like, at least for certain chapters of the Brotherhood. That wasn't a case in, like, Fallout Tactics, where they were openly welcoming ghouls into the Brotherhood, and Super Mutants and Death Claws and Raiders, too, so... Then again, Tactics isn't really considered canon, so you could potentially ignore that. And then we also get to see the Vault residents being relocated to the other vaults. We also get to have some more breadcrumbs of Vault 31 and what the heck Vault 31 is, because it is revealed that every Overseer came from Vault 31 that is an Overseer of Vault 33. This is basically the experiment and what's revealed in the final episode, Episode 8, which is called The Beginning. Now we get to understand a lot more of the past, where Vault 33, Vault 32, and Vault 31 were all experiments in conjunction with one another, where Vault 31 is supposed to have basically everybody that was cryogenically frozen and is supposed to be the leaders of the other vaults. These are like the management roles of it, which isn't too strange. We also get to see a robo brain in here and some more uh, just funny humor throughout this. I actually really like the little robo brain who's like the overseer of Vault 31. Also in the past, we get to see Mr. House, which is really cool. So this is a pre-war house. This is before he was uh, kind of a vegetable. <laughs> if you play New Vegas, you kind of know. And we also get to see, like, Sinclair representing Big Mountain, which that's pretty cool as well, especially with the little jab that uh, Mr. House has to Sinclair, saying something along the lines of he couldn't make a dollar even if he owned a casino, referring to the Sierra Madre from New Vegas, which is really cool. I, I like that a lot. We also get a bunch of other theories thrown around here as to what these other major corporations would want to do with their vaults that they technically own, since you can put any experiment that you want in the vault. And this is also shown all throughout the Fallout games. You hear, first hear about it in Fallout 2, where the Enclave basically tell you this straight up, where um, certain vaults weren't made to be uh, the best. They, <laughs> this was like all experiments. All the vaults were experiments to see what would make the best survivors. And some of these turned to making humans into super mutants. So this is with the FEV virus. And, you know, that one, I guess, technically kind of worked out pretty well for them. But then you have the, the problem of the other things with the super mutants. So there's that issue. You've got certain vaults where it's like, Oh, we're going to have it to where everybody has to compete for different food and stuff. So only the strongest will survive. We've got a one where everybody can go into a room and vote for whoever should die so that everybody else can live. 
and you know the the main goal here is to see how much humanity can uh just not do that basically we've got other ones where it's like a vault that's ruled on science only you, you see this one actually in the series which i actually fits the show really really well i i really do like the reveal of vault 4 i also thought this was kind of funny too when the raiders invade vault 33 coming from 32 and it's like what happens if they had invaded vault 34 that would have resulted in two potential options and i don't think either one would have been good for the raiders i we just get to see more of vault tech being evil overall as well as uh cooper kind of understanding that this is how evil vault tech is this also makes sense as to why cooper is so jaded as we go on since he is not a nice person once we're here in the present as him as the ghoul yeah, he's not the nicest person in the world, but he is a very sympathetic character, and I'm really looking forward to what they do more in the future. We get a big reveal at episode 8 as to why everybody wanted the scientist's head. We get more of the Raider Moldover, who was the main reason of this happening, and she was also in the past, I'm assuming cryogenically frozen, similar to how Hank is. And we also get the reveal that Hank works for vault and is evil. But that kind of wasn't much of a reveal for me, if you know anything about vault -Tex. And then he's off to New Vegas, which is teased at the very end of this, where you can see him coming upon a Deathclaw skull, looking out into the Mojave, and seeing New Vegas there. So uh, presumably he's going out to talk to Mr. House, which is rather interesting, because that will make Season 2, I think even potentially better. I would love to see a whole lot more stuff going on with Season 2, especially if we're going to be in New Vegas, because New Vegas, I think, is the best of the Fallout games, in my opinion. It's my personal favorite. And this series ends off quite well for the first season, where I'm really looking forward to seeing what we get in Season 2. Season 1 was really good. I think it nailed the vibe of Fallout perfectly. <laughs> it does a lot of things right. It has interesting characters. It has interesting lore to it. It has a good story to it. I love the backgrounds of it. The backgrounds are fantastic. Excellent music all throughout it as well. Excellent sound effects. A lot of them taken directly from the game, which I love. And there's just tons and tons of little references throughout all of this series to the Fallout games. If you played the Fallout games and you know where you can see like Nuka Colas, you can see all the different foods of like Yum Yum Devil Eggs. You can see the Blamco Mac and Cheese, the Sugar Bombs, even with like Hank calling Lucy his little Sugar Bomb, which fits so well. With this, I mean, I would love to see more of that, especially in Season 2 when it goes to New Vegas, because that's the one I'm the most familiar with. That's the one I've played the most, and the one that I usually make the most videos on. So I I really want to see that one. There was also some other really fun references throughout this of just people talking that um, fans could really get behind as well. Like Knight Titus saying that the Wasteland sucks, that he's been out here, and he had to go look for like an artifact for the Brotherhood, and all it was was a toaster which, I mean, uh, we do get to see Sinclair representing Big Mountain, so maybe it was that same toaster. If so, that's uh, interesting. There's also a line with Cooper when he says that, like, every time that we go to do something simple, we always get distracted by so much other BS throughout the wasteland, which is very true. If you've played any of the Fallout games, that's one of the best things about the Fallout games is that it can just be as simple as, I want to go and complete this mission. You run into some other people, you get talking with them, and they seem interesting, so you want to go and see what they're up to. You go and find a new place that you want to explore, you want to check out stuff, or you're just collecting junk. There's even a campaign that's going on right now with uh, Amazon where they're just giving away a bunch of free junk, especially a bunch of canned corn and beans to the Fallout community for entering into their stuff. For me, two big thumbs up for the Fallout TV series. I think it's actually really good. If you're a Fallout fan, or if you've ever been curious about Fallout as a series, in the lore, in the world, this one is going to be probably the easiest to get into as opposed to the games, because the games can be fairly long. I would say give the TV show a shot. If you're interested in playing the Fallout games, though, after you watch the TV show, you can really start with any of them because none of them are very connected with one another for just a general rundown of them. Fallout 1 is quite good, but it's a little bit short and it's an older game. It's an older turn-based game. So it might not be everybody's cup of tea, but I think it's actually quite good and it's not super long. Fallout 2 is one of the better ones. I think it has a really good story. It's still turn-based, kind of an older game. Shouldn't really have many issues, so that one I, I would recommend. Tactics is good, but it's an RTS game. You can turn it to a turn-based game. You probably should because the RTS mode is really janky in that one. It feels really bizarre to use, but that one's not technically considered canon, and I probably wouldn't recommend that one first. If you're going to play the turn-based games, I'd recommend one or two or even Shelter. Those ones are probably better for you. Shelter is a lot easier to get into, too, since it's free, and it actually has some of the characters from Fallout 
the TV series in it, which is nice now. Fallout 3 is the first first person game. So it's a first person shooter RPG game. That was the very first game that I got into and I really like it. But right now it's kind of weird to get into. If you're going to get it, I'd recommend getting it on the GOG site because that one you don't actually need to install mods for it to work. If you have it on Steam, then you usually have to mod it beforehand and that can be a pain, especially for new modders and people that just want to play the game. Just get it on GOG, that way you can play it normally. Fallout New Vegas is also fantastic and my personal favorite of the games. I would highly recommend that one, but it is janky as well. If you get it on Steam or if you get it in other places, it doesn't always run the best and you might need to mod it, but at least it will run and all the Fallout games have kind of a crash problem. So if you just start crashing out to your main menu or whatever, or just crashing the console if you're going to be playing on a console, just know that that's normal. It happens. Unofficial patches can help out with a lot with that. I don't know about 76 because I haven't played it, but uh, some people really like it. I, I, can't, I can't say. And then Fallout 4 is probably the one that I'd recommend the most. Fallout 4 is going to be the easiest one to get, and in like two weeks on the 25th of this month, then it also has uh, a new engine update to it. So it might work a bit better than it probably will run downtown Boston a little bit better. Fallout 4 has the most modern controls and it's the easiest to mod. So I would recommend that one over the other ones, even if I do personally enjoy like Fallout 3 and New Vegas a little bit more than 4, but 4 is still quite good. 4 is actually really good modded. So that's a brief overview and review of the Fallout TV show. As of right now, out of like a out of 10 rating, I'd probably give this one like an 8 or a 9. It's pretty good for like a video game TV show. If it's going to be compared to other TV shows, maybe a little bit lower, but honestly, I don't watch a whole lot of TV shows. It's not as good as something like Breaking Bad, but it's still quite good overall. So I would recommend it. It's a lot better than most of the other video game TV shows besides like Arcane being the only other one I can really think of at the moment. And maybe like the Castlevania anime too, which was also quite good. So tell me your thoughts on the Fallout TV series, if you've watched it or if you're going to watch it. And what would you like to see in season two? Uh, if we're going to New Vegas, I want to see a lot of stuff in season two. I want to see Joshua. I want to see remnants of Elijah. I want to see Mobius. I would love it if it was just a weird distress signal that you get from Mobius that comes over the radio or something. Potentially Victor and Mr. House in there and everything too. There's a lot of stuff in New Vegas that I want to see. So thank you guys so very much for watching this video. I hope that you guys enjoyed it and I'll talk to you next time. Bye bye everybody.